several years ago in the year 2000, I think I've told you this before, Cheryl and I had the opportunity uh, to travel to Israel. We were in country for about 16 days. It was a, a trip we'll never forget. It's a privilege if you've ever been there, you know, to visit the, the land of the Bible and where you get to see actually where events took place. One of the challenges that I personally faced when we went to Israel was that I ended up getting sick with a sinus infection. And back then, I actually used to get them all the time. It was before I had sinus surgery. And unfortunately, when I was in, in country at Israel, I uh, got sick and I got this really bad sinus infection. And I um, was wondering what to do. And I, I approached our, our, our tour guide and he goes, well, why don't you ask the, the bus driver? He probably knows where we can take you to a doctor. And, and so... Uh, he was a, an Arab Bedouin, and he was a very, very kind man, and, and um, one day we were going to be at his house for lunch, and he said, hey, when everybody's eating lunch, I'll have my brother take you to the doctor, and we'll take care of this, see what's going on, and I said, great, and so they all ate, and while I went to the doctor, and everything turned out great, they got me the meds that I needed, and I ended up eating when I got back from the doctor, which is another story, I have to tell you that one time, but Anyway, when I arrived back at the house, and his, the driver's name was Joel, when I got to Joel's house, everyone was enjoying some good conversation with Joel and his wife, and uh, being that he was an Arab Bedouin, we were very interested in his culture and had a lot of curiosity, and so people were asking him and his wife all these questions. And I don't remember exactly why the topic came up, but someone asked him, hey, I heard that in Islam, because he was a Muslim, that men are allowed to have multiple wives. And they started asking him about that, and, and he responded, and he said, uh, well, yeah, uh, that is permitted. I can have more than one wife if I so desire. Uh, the only uh, requirement is that I have to be able to provide for her any other wives that I, that I have. And um, it was interesting, not only did he say that, but his wife, who was there, confirmed what he was saying. And even though she was saying like, yeah, you know, if he wants to do that, he can do that and, you know, have to provide for her. But you could immediately tell that the topic bothered her. The, the, the idea that she would have to share her husband with another man repulsed her. Even though in Islam she was supposed to be okay with it, you can clearly tell she was not okay with that uh, concept. She didn't want to share her husband. Well, as you probably know, the practice of polygamy has been around since early civilization. We saw it early on in Genesis with Lamech, who was the first one to have two wives. Today, we're going to see it in the book of Genesis with Abram, where uh, we will see that the practice of polygamy, meaning having multiple wives, never goes well, meaning it's always problematic. Like Joel's wife in Israel, the one the story I just told you about, Sarai, Abram's wife, did not like the concept either. She was bothered by it, and we'll see how that uh, took place. However, we will see that even though this issue of polygamy was the result of Abram and Sarai's, really, ideas, and we'll see why, they were the ones who created the problems that they had to endure, even though that is true, God, as always, was there to help them deal with their problems and give them hope. So, please turn in your Bibles to Genesis 16 as we consider one of the names of God, which is El Roy, and how it means that he is the God who sees, and we will learn what it means to us. If you have any questions, and I would assume you might have some, particularly because of some of the stuff we're going to talk about today. Text those in. The number is in the handout, and uh, I'll answer those questions you texted in. So we're in Genesis 16, verse 1. Let's begin. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid, maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, Yahweh has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband 
Abram as his wife. He went into Hagar and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her sight. May Yahweh judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your own power. Do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarai treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. O God, our Father, open your word to us. We need to hear from you. We want you to speak. We are ready to listen. We need the Spirit of God who lives in us to give us insight, to give us understanding, so that we might be more like your Son. We ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, in this first section, the first six verses of chapter 16, we see the failure of self-reliance. The failure of self-reliance. In other words, what we just read is an example of how Abram and Sarai relied upon themselves and not upon God. The first thing the text addresses is the fact that Sarai, Abram's wife, was barren, meaning she was not able to have any children. And we were already introduced to that concept, if you remember, at the end of chapter 11, when we learn about who Abram was, where he came from, that his wife Sarai was barren. She had no children. Not only this, in the previous chapter, chapter 15, we learned that one of Abram's biggest struggles was the fact that he still didn't have any kids particularly because God had promised that through him, God would bless all the families of the earth, that he would become a great nation, and that multitudes would come from him. And if you remember, Abram's like, how is this going to happen, Lord? I don't even have one child. And that's what chapter 15 was about. And that's why, you know, Yahweh had sealed the covenant of his promise to Abram, saying, look, I'm going to do this. I Just trust me. It will happen. It will take place. Look at the stars in the sky. That's what you're... That is what your descendants will be like. You won't be able to count them. You will indeed have a son, and he will come from your own body. You remember that was chapter 15. Now, Sarai, we're told, doesn't have any children, right? She has this maid, Hagar, and she goes to Abram and says, Yahweh has prevented me from bearing children. And she's quite right that the reason why she did not have any children yet was because Yahweh had not given her any. She rightly understood that God alone is the one who gives life, who gives children. And what this means, that even though the conception of a baby is the result of a physical union between a man and a woman, conception will not take place unless God grants it. It is the gift of God. He alone gives it. All this to say that human reproduction is not just some naturalistic phenomenon, It is the work and gift of God Almighty, the Creator. He is the life giver. In fact, here's a couple of passages that support this. Uh, And it's in several passages. Here's just a couple examples. One in Isaiah 66, verse 9, speaking to Israel, he says, Shall I bring to the point of birth and not give delivery, says Yahweh? Or shall I who gives delivery shut the womb, says your God? In other words, God is the one who opens and closes the womb. God is the one who gives life. Later on in Genesis, we read that then Jacob's anger burned against Rachel, his wife, and he said, am I in the place of God who is withheld from you the fruit of the womb? She couldn't have children yet. We'll see that she does when we get there. But at this point, she couldn't have any. And Jacob's like, why are you upset at me? I can't give you children if God doesn't give you the child, right? So like I said, When Sarai said that Yahweh had prevented her from having children, she was quite right. God alone is the one who grants new life. Now the problem was that God had not given her a child and she wasn't getting any younger. Right? We're told in the text that they had already been in the land of Canaan for 10 years. Right? The beginning of verse 3. Time is passing and she still doesn't have a child. And, And it's not that she didn't trust the Lord at all. For she, she clearly did, right? She knew that God had said, an heir will come from your own body. 
So she goes, but I haven't had any children yet. And so she begins to devise a plan of her own. She finds her own solution to this. Now, it was the custom of the day to use a servant to bear your children. So what they did was not un, uh, unfounded, right? If you couldn't bear children, you'd take one of your servants and give her to your husband and she would bear a child. And then when that child was born, the woman of the house would adopt that child and that child would become the heir. It was common practice. It was common practice also for men to have multiple wives. So even though her suggestion is a lack of patience and a lack of trust in the Lord, it wasn't uncommon, at least not in the culture. Hagar being given to Abram would have been completely culturally acceptable. Being that she was an Egyptian means that they probably gained her. Remember in chapter 12 when Pharaoh had given Abram a lot of servants, Hagar was probably one of them. So Abraham appears when she comes up with the idea. His wife says, hey, why don't you take Hagar and she can have children for me and then that way we can have an heir. He doesn't seem to have a problem with that. He kind of, he goes along with it, right? It's not the first time where the husband just nods his head and says, yeah, dear, whatever you want, you know, and we're going to see that causes problems. I mean, what could go wrong? Sure, I'll take another wife. So after he takes her for another wife, she conceives and so far, everything seems to go according to plan. Like, hey, it, it worked out. Exactly what we desired is taking place. Yet as always, when we take matters into our own hands, without trusting upon the Lord, problems arise. After getting pregnant, we're told, Hagar, the maidservant, despised Sarah, or Sarai at this point. And we're not told exactly what she said. But when you think about it, it's not hard to imagine what took place, right? Hagar being the maidservant, right? You know, in the, in the ancient Near East, a, a woman's worth and social status was based primarily on her ability to have children, particularly many children, right? So uh, the fact that it, you, if, if a woman could not bear children, it was viewed as a failure and sometimes even a curse, even in, in letting her husband down. And those of you who know people who haven't been able to have children, you know what this struggle is. It's real. And Sarai was the woman of the house. It should have been her responsibility. Hagar was the servant. Yet she's the one who produced the child. You can imagine how it not only pleased Hagar, but caused her to flaunt it to Sarai. She might have said things like, well, it's a good thing Abraham had me or else he wouldn't have any kids. Right? Or she might even have said, hey, no, 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 no need to worry, Sarah, I got you. You know, I, I got this, you know, obviously Yahweh didn't bless you, but he blessed me. You can imagine how those types of conversations would have gone. Right? What could go wrong, right? With multiple wives. Well, as we just read, a lot went wrong. Sarai was humiliated. She was angry by how Hagar was treating her. And then we see, we read, she turns on Abram. She says, it's your fault. May God judge between you and I, because what is what has come upon me may may that come upon you. Once again, we see it isn't the first time when a husband is blamed for something that's not completely his fault. Don't worry, the husband has that fault too. I mean, he should have spoken up, right? He should have spoken up, not been so passive, shown some leadership. But truth be told, it wasn't his idea. It was his wife's. But it didn't matter. Sarai was not happy, which meant neither was Abram. So Abram reminded Sarai, like, hey, she's your servant. If you can do with her what you want, you have control over her. Now, most translations say that then Sarai treated her harshly. I think a better translation is that, you know, and that kind of communicates that she was cruel. A better translation, I think, is that Sarai humbled Hagar. And I'm the only one who thinks that. Men like Luther and others uh, thought that was a better translation as well. In other words, Sarai put Hagar in her place. She reminded her, hey, look, at, you're not the woman of the house. I am. You're the servant. In fact, you're my servant. And more than likely, what she probably did is made Hagar go live with the servants again and do servants work. In other words, hey, you, you're not the woman. I am, and you're, I'm going to prove it to you. Go back and do the work that servants do. Now, even though she had conceived a thing Sarai was not capable of doing, 
even though Hagar had been favored all of a sudden above all the other maidservants, she was still the servant and Sarai reminded her of that. Kind of sounds like a daytime drama, doesn't it? You know, as the, you know, biblical world turns, you know, and all these twists and, and plot changes. And it practically was like that. No one was innocent. Abram should have shown more leadership, right, and prevented the mess. Sarai should have been a bit more rational, not so emotional. Hagar should have been more humble and not so prideful, right? Everyone's at fault. Yet, none of this stuff took place, and this is why we have this disaster. Which, as a result, Hagar flees. She runs away. She couldn't take the shame and the humiliation. Now, before we continue on, I want to address a particular issue that comes up in this particular passage and what we can learn from it. And it is the issue or the question, you know, why did God permit polygamy? This isn't the first instance that we see in the scriptures, the Old Testament at least, where God permits polygamy, meaning multiple wives, men who have multiple wives. It's the first recorded instance of a godly man who committed polygamy. And we have to ask ourselves, why? Why did God do this. We know from chapter 2 that he designed marriage to be between one man and one woman. That It was that way from the beginning. And yet many godly men in the Old Testament scriptures had multiple wives. Abram is one of them. Uh, Jacob, David, to name a few. So why did God permit it? Why is there even instruction in the law of Moses governing polygamy? Well, the answer is simply this, that even though God had designed marriage to be monogamous, one man, one woman, he understood and was patient with his people, and he knew that they were sinners, right? He, when he began to call his people to himself, when he begins to save people to himself, he met them where they were at. In the beginning, they were obviously, as a whole, very spiritually immature. And as time progressed... God revealed more and more of his truth, right? They began to spiritually mature. So rather than address every single sin of his people all at once, God, particularly in the sin of polygamy, permitted polygamy for a time. He gave them instruction even on how to uh, not to abuse their wives and to make sure that they're taken care of. That's what we see in the law of Moses. However, as God's people matures in, this, in, in the plan of redemption, God reminds them like, hey, the, de the design for marriage is one woman, one man. And later on, he begins to require that once again. Think of it this way. When you're teaching a child something, when they're learning something, you don't overwhelm them by addressing every fault and failure as they're learning, right? Right? If you address one at a time. If you don't do this, they're going to become easily disheartened or overwhelmed. The same was true for God's people. God instructed his people on other issues of holiness before he addressed the issue of polygamy. Now, having said this, even though it was permitted for a time, every time a man had multiple wives in the scriptures, it was a domestic disaster. Abram, big disaster. Jacob, even worse right? Uh, Elkanah, Hannah's husband, that was a disaster. David's multiple wives, Solomon's multiple wives. It always, it always, uh, all these problems stemmed from having multiple wives. In other words, it never works because it's not God's design. So, which leads us to the truth that I believe that this particular, these verses address, and it's simply this. Every time we fail to trust God, we can expect more problems. Every time. Both Abram, Sarai were at fault for this mess. They both knew that the Lord had promised Abram an heir from his own body, meaning not through adoption. He wanted to adopt a child, and then they go, no, you're going to have one from your own body. Both of them at this point had already experienced the power and protection of God. Right? We saw God's power displayed when he delivered Sarai from the Pharaoh of Egypt, the most powerful man in the land. We saw God's protection when he fought for Abram when he went against that coalition of four kings. Right? They'd have already experienced God's power. 
They had every reason to trust him that, hey, he's going to fulfill his word. He's able to do what he says. And yet they faltered. Their faith was not perfect. Which means what happened to them can happen to us. There is a reason why God commands us to trust him. And it's because he always knows what's best for us. He is the one who designed us. And he is the one who is the source of what is good and what is true. Right? We would never, at least I don't think, presume to tell an engineer of Tesla, let's say, how an electric car should work that they designed. Nor would we try to, you know, tell a developer or a designer of one of, the, uh, one of Apple's iPhones and tell them like, hey, this is what the phone should be able to do. We wouldn't presume to do that. Why? Because we didn't make those things. We didn't design them. We weren't the engineers. The same is true with God's creation. He is the one who designed and made everything, including us. And he is the one whom we need to trust if we want things to go well. However, as you know, we have a problem with that. We have a problem with trusting him at times. We like to think we know better. We have a problem called sin and our sinful desires, and they get in the way. Think about it. We don't like to love our enemies. Are you kidding me? I don't want to love my enemy. It just doesn't feel right. We don't want to wait for the Lord. We, have a, we struggle with patience. It's frustrating. I want it now. Why do I have to wait? We struggle with fear, and it leads us to, to make wrong decisions. To put it bluntly, we often fail to trust God in his design. We can rest assured every time we fail to trust him, our problems will multiply. In the same way, if you leave your laptop in the pool, your life will have problems if you fail to trust God. Lying to others will always result in broken relationships. A lack of self-control will always get you into trouble. Being self-centered will never satisfy you. Valuing possessions over people will never go well, right? A failure to submit to God's commands will only bring us misery and problems. This has always been true and it will always be true. And we see it here in the life of Abram, Sarai, and Hagar. Well, let's return to the text where we see the faithfulness of God in verses 7 through 14. Look what takes place here. Now, the angel of Yahweh found her by a spring of water, meaning Hagar, in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of Yahweh said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of Yahweh said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. And the angel of Yahweh said to her further, Behold, you are with child, you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because Yahweh has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man, his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all of his brothers. Then she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her, you are a God who sees, or in the Hebrew, El Roy. For she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? Therefore, the well was called Bir Laharoi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered. Here's where we see the faithfulness of God. Even though Hagar seems to have some, be somewhat of a victim in this domestic disaster, as we said, she wasn't completely innocent, right? Her pride got the better of her when she despised Sarah, her mistress, for not have, being able to have children. So in one sense, we could say she was enduring the consequences of not only Abram and Sarai's sin, but her own as well, right? Her own pride. Yet, God does not abandon her. He didn't abandon her, did he? He was gracious to her. As she ran away, she finds herself at a spring near uh, uh, where there was also a well, as we read about in verse 14, on the way to Shur. What this tells us is that she was on her way back to Egypt. She was going south. In other words, she was trying to go back home. Now, if you know this part of the country of Israel, it was, it's not exactly hospitable. It's hot, it's dry, it's barren, right? It would have been difficult for any woman to traverse that part of the country on her own, let alone a pregnant woman, right? She 
is in a bad place. While there, the angel of Yahweh appears to her. Now, we know that she sees him, and it's not a vision, because in verse 13, she makes reference to the fact that she saw him. Now, before we get into her reaction to what he said, and what he said, and what it all means, I want, I want to address the question of, who is the angel of Yahweh? Because you'll see it plays, it gives us understanding of what's really going on here. Who is the angel of Yahweh? This is the first time in scripture where we run into this person, the angel of Yahweh. The word angel, as you know, communicates that he is a messenger. And as you know, angels are created beings who carry out God's will, right? We see that in all of the scripture. They are the ones who deliver God's word. They are the ones who interpret dreams and visions. And they are the ones who protect God's people. However, the angel of Yahweh is different. What I mean is that there are angels of Yahweh, and then there is the angel of Yahweh. For starters, notice how Hagar is surprised that she remained alive after seeing him. Have I even remained alive, verse 13, here after seeing him? When we see that in the scriptures, that is indicative of when someone is confronted by God himself, what we call a theophany, an appearance of God, right? Right? They think they're going to die. She also refers to him as Yahweh. Then she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her. You are a God who sees. She calls him God. Now there are several passages in the Old Testament that communicate the same thing. I'll, we'll, we'll look at a couple. If you want to turn there, look to uh, Exodus chapter 3 in a couple of uh, the next book. We see that when Moses is confronted by the Lord in the burning bush, we see the angel of Yahweh in that passage. Exodus chapter 3 verse 2. It says, The angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. So it says it's the angel of Yahweh. Right? Look at verse 4 though. It says, When Yahweh saw that he had turned aside, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And then he says, do not come here, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He goes on to say, I am the God of your father, the God of Abram, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Wait a minute, verse 2 says it was the angel of Yahweh. And yet, the angel of Yahweh speaks as Yahweh, he says that he is God. If you turn to your right in the book of Judges, chapter 6, in the, instant, or the, the, the account of Gideon, we see the same thing. The angel of the Lord. We see that get, you know, the, the, the Israelites were being oppressed and God raises up the judge Gideon to deliver his people. Verse 11, we see that the angel of Yahweh came and sat under the oak, which is in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite. As his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him and said, Oh, val you know, Yahweh is with you, O valiant warrior. And then he goes on, if, if you continue to go in the passage, it says, Yahweh said to him. Not the angel of Yahweh, but Yahweh. We see the same thing in chapter 13 with Manoah, Samson's parents. The angel of Yahweh appears to his parents and they think they're going to die because they saw God. So, who is this angel of Yahweh? Well, he's definitely not no mere angel. He is God himself. Now, if God exists in three persons, which he does, which person of the Godhead is he? Is he the Father? Is he the Son? Or is he the Holy Spirit? Well, let's look at this particular passage, what John says in his gospel. We saw this when we went through the gospel of John. He said, no one has seen God at any time. No one. But he goes on to say, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Well, who is the only begotten God in that context? It's the Word. And who is the Word in the context? We're told, the one who dwelt among us, who is Jesus Christ. So in other words, the only time anyone has ever seen God, they've seen Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. He has explained, he has manifested him. No one has ever seen the Father. Furthermore, no one has ever seen the Holy Spirit since he is spirit. The only conclusion is that the angel of Yahweh is Jesus. 
before he became a man. We would therefore say that the angel of Yahweh is the uh, pre-incarnate Jesus, meaning before he took upon himself flesh or before his incarnation. There's also the fact that the angel of Yahweh never appears in the New Testament after Jesus' after Jesus's incarnation. So, the one who appeared to Hagar, all that to say, is Jesus before he took upon himself human flesh. Now, let's consider what he did and said to her. Notice how he appears. We go back to Genesis 16. He appears to her in her distress. She's fleeing. She's desperate. It's possible she wouldn't have made it to Egypt. And yet he meets her at this well, right? She may have been at the well having second thoughts. Oh, wow, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I should have stayed. Now my life's in danger. She may not have immediately known who it was when he speaks to her. She tells him of her distress and her situation. And then he commands her. Go back to Sarai, submit to her, and I will make you, I will bless your seed, I will, your descent, I will multiply your descendants so that they will not be too many to be counted. She goes on to say that you will bear a child, he will be a son, and you shall name his, his name shall be called Ishmael because Yahweh has given heed to your affliction. And then he gives a prophecy on what type of man he would be. And Hagar would have heard this and that would, she would have understood that to be an enormous blessing. Not only because she was a woman who was able to see God, hear from him, but also because she was only a servant. Right when she thought all hope was lost, Jesus came to her and promised that he would bless her. The promise of the blessing is connected to the fact that she was conceived from Abraham and God said that he would bless Abraham so she gets to take part in that blessing but it doesn't diminish the fact that God was going to greatly bless her she benefited from having Abram's child and she would have understood that notice how Jesus commands her he says name him Ishmael which means God hears what this tells us is that Hagar had been praying to Yahweh and he heard her she had learned from the family that Yahweh was the one true God. She learned how to cry out to him. She learned how to trust him and depend upon him like Abram. She was a believer. She understood that the only one who could help her was Yahweh. For this reason, she prayed to him and he heard her prayers. He also tells about her son's future. He'll be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and every hand will be against him. And he will dwell in the east of his brother's. It means that he would be a contentious man. That's what that wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, everyone's hand against him. He would not easily get along with everybody. We learn later in Genesis that Ishmael is the father of the Arab peoples. And we have seen through their history, they, are, they have been a contentious people. Which means that the Arab peoples descend from a mixture of Hebrews and Egyptians come the Arab peoples. And by the way, they, under, they, they know that. The, the Arab peoples, they revere Abram or Abraham as their father. And this is where it comes from. And they have been a contentious people throughout their long history. So what the angel of Yahweh, what Jesus said, did come true, obviously. When Hagar heard what, what, what Yahweh would do for her, what Jesus said to her, even though she didn't understand him as Jesus, she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her El Roy, the God who sees or the God who sees me. God had heard her prayers. God had seen her affliction. And she recognized this. So she commemorates this encounter by naming the well Bir Laharoi, which means the well of the living one who sees. This is a truly an amazing encounter. And she knew it. Hagar was aware of it. We can also learn and be encouraged by this account, as I said, because the angel of Yahweh the conclusion is that he is the pre-incarnate Christ. And it teaches us that Jesus always gives you hope in the midst of your distress. Always. That's the way Jesus is. That's, that's how he operates. Hagar was downtrodden. She was desperate. She was in distress. Right? As, as quickly as the blessing came upon her, so did the distress. And then she's forced to live as a servant. Once again, she goes back. That those family dynamics of jealousy, betrayal, and pride would continue to ravage the family and she would be on the receiving end. Yet, 
This didn't prevent Jesus from giving her hope. Even though she was responsible for some of the mess, he still gives her hope in the midst of her anguish. He gave her hope, the hope that she needed. In fact, he, notice that he didn't take the difficulty away, did he? Jesus didn't say, hey, you know what? I understand what's going on. Abram and Sarah are being a little bit cruel. You know, you have your part. Let's deal with your part, and then I'll deal with them, and, and we'll make this a better situation. He didn't do that, did he? He says, go back. Submit to your mistress. Go back to that life of difficulty. Go back to that difficult situation. Trust me. Submit to me. You're not going to be her equal. That's not what I'm going to do. Go back and take your place as a servant. However, in order to motivate her, what does he do? He gives her hope. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your descendants. They will be great. They will, you know, and we're going to see the, the Arab peoples come from her. This is what Jesus does for his people. He doesn't always deliver us from distress. In fact, he frequently expects us to endure it, right? He doesn't always take away the sickness. He doesn't always improve our health. He doesn't always bless us financially with wealth. He doesn't always give us the job that we want. He doesn't always give us a life of ease and comfort. In fact, he rarely does. However, he does promise to be with us and he promised to answer our cries when we cry out to him for help. In fact, I want to we still got a lot to do, but I want to show you something. Go flip to Philippians chapter 4. I want to show you something. Because what we see of Jesus in the Old Testament remained true in the New Testament. Philippians chapter 4, and we're familiar with this passage because it, it's the one that instructs us to pray. i got to get my ribbon here. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, we are told this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Now get this. The Lord is near. We can even translate that as the Lord is with you. He's near to you. Which is why he goes on to say, be anxious. Don't be worried about anything. Do be anxious for nothing. Why? Because the Lord is near. And because he is near in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That was going on with Hagar. I'm, I hear you. I see you. I've answered your prayer. I will enable you to endure what you're going through. I will grant you, but Je I will, you know, the peace of God. He goes on to say, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. In other words, focus on the truth. Don't be worried. I'm right with you. Remi you know, be reminded of what I tell you, the hope that I give you. Trust in me, not in what you're going through. We're told to cry out to him for help and he will hear. Not to dwell on our circumstances of what might or might not be. Focus on the truth. And he will give us peace. That's the hope Jesus always brings. Those of you who have been there, you know what I'm talking about. God remains the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He has always been this way. He gives us hope. Well, continuing on, go back to the end of the chapter as we finish what goes on in this instance of Hagar and Abram and the mess that they made of everything and God as he came to clean it up look what it says in verse 15 last two verses so Hagar bore Abram a son and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him the fact that she bore him a son means that she went back. She returned, just as the angel of Yahweh commanded. The fact that Abram names the son Ishmael tells us that Hagar communicated to both Abram and Sarah, hey, this is what happened. I ran away, and you, you know the mess. And when I was at this well, and sure, I, God appeared to me, and he promised me, and he told me to come back. Therefore, I came back, and he also said to name the son Ishmael. And Abram submits. He goes, well, if that's what God told you. 
then we will name him Ishmael. She submitted, even though it had been a difficult thing to do. We're going to see that this infighting within this house of multiple wives isn't over. The conflict between her and Sarah is not over. Having multiple wives always brings strife. Yet despite this, Hagar obeyed. This means that she trusted Yahweh. It means that her faith in him was not in word only. It was in action. And she demonstrated her faith in Yahweh by submitting to him. And as we close our time, we will see that submission to God's will is proof that we trust him, even when it is difficult to do so. This, as I have just said, was true for Hagar and it's true for all of us. Now you might ask, now, well, how do we know if we're going through difficult circumstances? How do we know it's God's will? Well, it's not that difficult to figure out if you, if you just stop and think about it even though it is difficult to accept at times. Ask yourself in your, your circumstances that are difficult, ask yourself, is what's happening to us, to me, is it a result of my own sin? Have I failed to do something God told me to do, or am I doing something God prohibits in his word? If the answer is yes, then it's God's will that you're going through those consequences, the difficult situation, so that you will learn to repent and trust in him the next time. However, sometimes you're going through a difficult situation and you ask yourself that question. You're saying, is there any sin in my life that God's trying to reveal? Is he, is, is, he, is he disciplining me for my sin to teach me something? And if you can say, honestly, no, I haven't done anything. And yet you're still in these difficult circumstances. And then you ask, God, God take these away from me, and he doesn't. Then the answer is, and then it's God's will for you to walk through that trial. You know how I can say that? Think about it. God can do anything he wants. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. He can prevent anything. He can send it. He can deliver you from anything. And if you're going through a trial and he tells, and you ask him to take it away and he doesn't take it away, then you can trust that, hey, I want this for you. I'm trying to teach you something. He has a purpose. Maybe he wants us to grow. Maybe he wants us to depend upon him. Maybe he just wants to bring him glory. The question is, do we trust him enough to submit to him in the midst of difficulty? The proof that we trust him is that we submit to him like Hagar did. We're willing to walk through the valley knowing that God is with us. We're willing to put our faith into action. Submission is the fruit of faith. In fact, you can look at first where... I wanted to spend some time there, but you can see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 and following, God says, submit for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Submit. Align yourself under the authority, even when it's difficult. Trust me. Submit. Wives, even when your husbands are disobedient to the word, submit. Trust me. Husbands, love your wives even when they don't follow you. Submit to me. And he gives Jesus as the example of that who entrusted himself to a faithful creator by doing what is right. If you trust me, he says, submit. Jesus knows when we're going through difficulties. He hears our cries. He sees what we're going through. And he says, I will be with you. I will not abandon you. And he says, trust me. Submit to what you're going through. We need to learn to not always ask him to take them away. But we need to learn to ask him, Give me the strength to endure. Give me the back to carry the burden because I'm overwhelmed. I've already asked you to take it away. You said no, and the reason I know you said no is because you haven't done it yet. Or at least you're saying not yet. So if it's not yet, Lord, help me walk through that difficulty because I trust you. You see that? Submission is the fruit of faith. It was true in the life of Hagar, and it's true in our life as well. Amen? So, what we learned, the Lord Jesus knows when we are suffering, and he will always be there for us. You can count on it. Did we get any questions? Well, as the music team comes back to the platform, 
we are reminded. And we see this different parts of the scripture where God's people cry out either for justice or deliverance. And it didn't come immediately. They had to endure. But what the cross reminds us of is that God is not bound by time. In other words, just because there is a time when evil appears to flourish and be unanswered, it doesn't mean God's not going to do anything about it. The cross reminds us that God, even in the Old Testament, passed over sins previously committed and placed them on Jesus at the cross. Because he's not bound by time. The problem for us is we're creatures of time. We tend to think as we wait, God doesn't care. Because he hasn't done anything about it yet. The cross reminds us that he does. Nothing escapes his sight. He knows exactly what we need and he has decided when to act. He did so at the cross. He does so in our lives individually and he will do so at the end when he comes to remake his creation. And we can trust him. Father, as we approach the Lord Jesus' table, as we seek to honor him, to remember him, we are reminded that he took care of our greatest need, even when we weren't looking for it. He went to the cross and paid our debt that we might be forgiven, that we might be renewed, that we might know you and that we might love you. Jesus, we thank you. You are a faithful, good, and kind Savior. You are a merciful Lord, and you are our glorious King. Amen.